Hello again, Crime Scene Photography students. Welcome back uh, to our virtual classroom. We're going to continue on with our lecture series. Um, this is week two, and we're talking about tricky hidden evidence. We're still talking about macro photography, but I'm going to throw a couple more obstacles at you guys that are very common that we run into pretty much all the time on crime scenes. So uh, let's get started. Okay, so this week we're still talking about macro photography and we're going to talk about these additional obstacles uh, that I told you about earlier. Evidence is not always located out in the open uh, with plenty of light for your camera to use. Oftentimes it's actually found under furniture, stuck in weird places on the vehicle, or in strange lighting conditions. And we as crime scene photographers have to be able to work around those conditions because we have to photograph things in situ, right? We have to photograph things that are in place that haven't been altered by us. So this week's lecture we're going to talk about these tricky situations and give you the tricks of the trade on how to deal with them. Vehicles are kind of like mini crime scenes um, and we conduct vehicle examinations at the City of Phoenix Police Department all the time especially related to homicides. So the evidence in these vehicles needs to be found and documented the same way you would document it on a larger scene but your conditions are more cramped and the locations of the evidence are a little bit more challenging so to assist with the documentation process the crime scene photographer really needs to be able to add light to the scene to make hidden evidence visible and you guys see that little star there that means that's something you need to take note of okay uh, keep track of that because you're probably going to see it again either in a quiz or on a homework assignment. So for this week's assignment you need to practice taking photographs of small evidence because we're talking about macro photography in difficult to reach places and the slides that I'm going to walk you through are going to show you how to orient yourself to get the best shots and we're going to talk about the tools that you need to use uh, for troubleshooting. So here's your vehicle evidence walkthrough. Okay, remember, no, no matter what type of evidence shot you're being asked to take, including a few mid-range shots of your scene will help orient your viewers. So here we are in my garage looking at my car, and it's pretty obvious from this mid-range shot that we're looking at the driver's side of the car. This is another mid-range shot leading you into the area that we're going to be examining. So we're looking at the back seat of the car or we're getting ready to. Okay, another mid-range shot showing us another area of the car. So we're in the back passenger section and the center of the photograph is really on the back of the driver's seat. So most likely that's the area we're going to head into. And here we go, we're down on the floorboard. So all of these have been mid-range shots. Um, the same mid-range shots that you would compose if you were out on a crime scene uh, inside, uh, in a living room, outside, in a backyard. It really doesn't matter. Mid-range shots are always necessary to orient your viewer as to where they are in the scene. So those are very, very important. Some of the most, uh, probably the most important photographs that we take on a crime scene. Okay, now if your camera has a pre-flash function like mine does, it's possible that your point-and-shoot model is actually perfect for these kinds of shots. Um, what the pre-flash does is you can take your camera into a low-lit situation or dark situation. Um, in our shot here, we're actually underneath the seat. I'm basically laying on the floorboards, pointing the camera towards my cell phone there. Uh, it was pitch black under that, under that seat but what my camera will do is if I try and focus it, so I push down the shutter release button just a little bit to focus, the camera actually throws out a little pre-flash. Um, it'll flash a couple times, not taking the photograph, but giving the camera enough light to be able to focus. And remember, last week we talked about how your camera needs that color contrast to be able to focus, right? So if it's pitch black, it can't see anything. So that's why digital camera manufacturers have created this pre-flash function. Um, so that's what it's going to do. It's going to throw out a little bit of light and be able to focus and compose on the shot. 
um, and that's, that's going to allow your camera to focus. So this shot worked out really well, just with my little point-and-shoot camera, uh, autofocus, auto-flash, worked out fine. Now, if your camera doesn't have this option, that's okay. You can work around it. All right, so we know that our camera needs light. It, need, it needs to be able to see color contrast to be able to focus, right? So why don't you just go ahead and add the light yourself, okay? In this shot, uh, I placed a flashlight on the floorboard and lit up the cell phone. So with the addition of light, my camera didn't need the flash, and I got the shot without using the internal flash at all. So now be careful when you use your point and shoot cameras, if you turn your flash off, you're going to have low shutter speeds. And if you don't know what that means, that's okay. <laughs> we're going to get to that um, next week and we're going to really hit a very strong review on your exposure controls. But if you are not using your internal flash and your camera shows you a motion shake caution, that's okay. Just make sure that your camera is resting against something stationary, like the floor or a wall or something like that. So in this shot, I put the camera on the floorboard, I turn the flashlight on, I turn the internal flash off, and I took the shot just like this. And I actually like this shot a little bit better than the last one. Um, there are a couple more shadows in here, but you can actually see some of the um, under wires of the, uh, the driver's seat, and I think you can tell what we're looking at maybe even a little bit better uh, than, than the shot with the internal flash. Okay, so now we're back to another mid-range shot, and basically what I'm telling the viewer is we're going to a different part of the vehicle. So I've centered in on the back of the driver's seat. Map pockets are notoriously difficult uh, for photographing evidence in, and they are places where criminals love to shove evidence. <laughs> so it's kind of a catch-22 for us. Um, in this shot, you see me trying to pull back the flap um, to be able to photograph a little disk drive that's in there, a little thumb drive. Um, this shot is okay for a mid-range, but as you can see, you, you cannot see the disk, so it's not going to work for a macro shot. So let's see how much better we can get. Okay, this isn't a bad shot. You, you can see the thumb drive um, at the bottom of the pocket. But because I'm using my internal flash unit and I can't change the position of that flash, my hand is blown out and the hotspot is a little distracting. Uh, so let's play around with our camera and our tools and see if we can get a better shot. Okay, this one's a lot better. Not only have I zoomed in more and I'm filling the frame, um, but what I did was I took a flashlight, a small flashlight, and I put it into the map pocket with the USB drive and lit it up that way. So again, I'm not using my internal flash at all in this shot. I turned it off completely. And as I said before, I'm filling the frame and uh, I'm getting a nicely lit shot without the use of flash. So there you go. Okay, let's talk a little bit about photographer position. Um, because we've been focusing on the evidence in the back seat area of this car, uh, that's where you would expect me to be standing. Uh, all the mid-range shots were from the same open rear driver's side door. And that's great. It's, it's a good way to set up your mid-range shots so that your viewer always knows what they're looking at. But now we have evidence that's in a different part of the car. So let's talk about how you deal with that situation. So this isn't a bad mid-range shot. From the mid-range before, we knew what part of the car we were looking at. So the viewer can definitely see that there's an object behind the headrest on the passenger side. But once you have this shot, don't get stuck. You're a movable part <laughs> in this equation. So you can be at any part of the vehicle that you want to be at. So move around and make sure that you're getting the best shot possible. Okay, Change your position to get the best shot. Okay, this shot is perfect for showing what the, uh, what the object actually is, but what happened to our light there? Okay, this shot was taken using the internal camera flash, and it washed out the background of the evidence with too much light. You can see that large area of white space uh, ne near the front muzzle of the gun, and that's a problem. Um, and here's a little side note. Uh, 
when you compare digital photography and film photography, if you're going to make a mistake, if you're going to overexpose your photograph, meaning that you have too much light in it, um, or you're going to underexpose your photograph, meaning that there's not enough. With digital photography, if you have to make a mistake, you always want to underexpose as opposed to overexpose. Um, the reason for that, without getting too complicated, is that it's a computer disk that the camera is writing onto. And if a camera sees 100% white, it's going to record that as a zero. It's a binary code. So it's going to record it as a zero, and there's not going to be any information there at all. Uh, so there's nothing to enhance. You can't take it into a digital darkroom. You can't use Photoshop or anything like that to bring back information because nothing was recorded. Um, the opposite of that is actually true for film photography. Film photography uh, is based on silver halide crystals and how much light they get depends on how much information is sketched with those silver halide crystals. So it's a little bit of a reverse. That's just a little uh, background for you for digital, digital photography. So anyway, in this shot we've got too much light, so what can we do? Alright, to get this shot, you can lessen the amount of light put out by your flash and you have two options to do it. You can change the output of your flash using your camera options. You might be able to do this. You look through your manual and see if there's a flash compensation. They might even call it exposure compensation where you can actually dial down the, um, the amount of light that's coming out of your, of your camera's flash. Or, if you can't do that, just move farther away from the object and zoom in, which is what I did in this situation. Here's a little note about some professional equipment that we use as crime scene specialists that you're probably not going to have access to, but I want you guys to know about it because you're going to run into it uh, once you become crime scene investigators. So, Most agencies issue their crime scene specialist a DSLR, and DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex Camera. Um, and these are a bit bulkier and they are also equipped with uh, movable lenses that allow the photographer complete control over their exposure settings. So they have manual mode, they have uh, time value or uh, shutter priority mode, uh, aperture priority mode, you can change your ISO, you can change between macro and regular photography, uh, you just you have a plethora of options that, that, that you can use. Um, and they do have internal flashes, but most of the time crime scene photographers are going to use their external flash units like the one shown below. Um, the reason we do that is, one, they are a lot more powerful than the internal flash on a DSLR. And as you can see, they are, can be moved around. They're not just stuck on top of the camera or uh, on the hot shoe. That curly cord that's attached to the external flash is actually called an off-shoe cord because it attaches to the flash and it attaches to the camera's hot shoe and it allows the flash to be moved in all different angles wherever the photographer wants to hold it. Alright, let's move on to our next tricky situation, which is uh, dealing with shadow. Uh, small confined spaces like vehicles aren't the only places you're going to run into problems with shadow. Okay? Remember, as a crime scene specialist, you can't pick the location your evidence will be found in, and you also can't pick the time of day it will be found. So dealing with objects that are found in dark shadows when the rest of your scene is really bright is a tricky situation that you're going to be faced with as a crime scene photographer. So let's talk about how to deal with that. Last week, we talked about the fact that your camera needs different colors and contrast to focus, right? I've been hitting home with uh, that concept <laughs> repeatedly throughout these lectures, so it's an important thing uh, to keep in mind. And that's true, but if you have a highly contrasty scene, meaning that you have a lot of highlighted areas and you have a lot of shadows, your camera can have a hard time deciding how much light it actually needs for that specific shot. Okay, it's asking itself, should, should I expose for the highlighted area? Should I close down my aperture and make my shutter speed really fast because there's so much light? Or should I expose for the shadow? The shadow is a lot darker, I need to open up my aperture, I need a longer shutter speed. So you got to remember that your camera is just a tool for you to use. It can't make those types of composition choices for you. You're the photographer, you have to tell it what to do. Um, so you have to decide what elements of your scene are important. 
So let's look at some options for dealing with these very contrasty scenes that have a lot of shadows. Okay, so here's your shadow evidence walkthrough if this is what you guys uh, decide to do for your assignment this week. Um, this is a scene that has a lot of contrast. Okay, we've got the dark shadows being made by the sun, and they're in sharp contrast with the bright color of the cement and the patio table. And it just so happens that our evidence is right in the middle of a shadow. You can almost see it there. It's right in the center of the photograph. It's a knife, and its blade is laying in a highlight, and its handle is laying in a low light or a shadow. And here's another mid-range shot showing you what we're looking at. Now, this isn't a necessarily a bad mid-range. Um, the person who's viewing this photograph can tell what it is. Um, but when you go to actually take a macro photograph of it or a very close-up shot of it to show the detail, uh, we want to deal with these very distracting shadows. So let's see how we do that. So you tell what the object is, and then there's that dark shadow cutting through the middle of the shot. It's very distracting, and it's not a great close-up photograph, mainly because of that very distracting uh, visual element of the really sharp highlight and the really sharp contrast of the shadow. Um, so this particular shot was taken without a flash. This is exactly what the scene looks like to the human eye. Um, so let's play around with our flash and see if we can get a better shot. Okay, in this shot, I took the picture using my internal flash, and the shadow was definitely lightened. You can see that. You can see that the handle is much more visible. But now we have the blade overexposed, right? Now, fill flash is a technique that we can use in crime scene photography because we have an external flash. We can take our flash off of the camera, get it closer to the shadow, and actually light up the shadow as opposed to the entire picture that the camera is composed on. Um, but if you're stuck with a point-and-shoot camera, that's okay. Just because you can't do your fancy fill flash technique doesn't mean that you can't get a really good shot. So here's another option for you guys. Okay, just because you can't move the evidence, that doesn't mean that you can't move, right? We talked about that in the vehicle many times. We can actually use our shadows as a tool on scene to get the shots we want. So in this picture, I used my body to create a shadow. So I stood in between the sun and the evidence, and I put the entire piece of evidence in shadow. So I actually took light away from the shot and achieved a nice, uniformly lit picture.